the economic benefit of free trade, even unilaterally adopted free trade, is that it ensures access to the maximum possible quantity of goods and services and the maximum possible variety of goods and services. In contrast, restraints on trade artificially reduce people's access to goods and services. Restraints on trade create artificial scarcity. I ask, how can we be made richer by our government obstructing our access to goods and services, regardless of what other governments do. Goods and services that we judge by our voluntary actions, by our spending our own money, to be worthwhile. Would you be enriched if government annually destroys, say, 5% of your household goods? Let's say you own $50,000 worth of household and personal goods. You have furniture like a sofa and a desk, you have appliances like a washer and a dryer, a uh, coffee maker. Uh, you have an automobile in your garage, you have clothing in your closet, you have pharmaceuticals in your medicine chest. Would you be enriched if each year the government hired thugs to destroy $2,500 worth of these possessions? They break into your house and destroy them. Of course not. While a few producers might benefit, say the furniture maker who sells you a sofa after the thugs destroyed your older one, clearly you and your family are made poorer by this policy that is explicitly designed to increase the amount of scarcity that you must endure. A policy of protective tariffs differs in no economically relevant ways from a policy of routinely deploying thugs to break into people's house to destroy household possessions. The only difference is superficial. A policy of protective tariffs artificially reduces the amount of goods that you and your family enjoy by reducing the amount that you initially acquire, while a policy of deploying destructive thugs reduces the amount of goods that you and your family enjoy by reducing the amounts only after you bring those goods home. Either way, you're poorer. Many people reject this comparison of destructive thuggery with protective tariffs. Surely, government-orchestrated destruction differs fundamentally from trade barriers, they say. But they're wrong. Even protectionists cannot avoid admitting that trade barriers and thuggery have the same initial effect, fewer goods and services available for peaceful people to consume. Ah, replies the protectionist. See, I did call them protectionists. The key word here is initial. We protectionists advocate the artificial creation of greater scarcity today as a means of increasing abundance tomorrow. The artificial scarcity that we create with trade barriers creates more and better paying jobs at home, thus increasing abundance tomorrow. If you fall for this protectionist canard, understand that a policy of destructive thuggery can be justified on exactly the same grounds. The government can point to the jobs that exist only because it hired thugs to bust your sofa to pieces and to slash the tires on your car. So I urge you to ask a protectionist, what's the difference if a job in, say, the domestic furniture industry is created because a government agent prevents you from buying a chair made in China, compared to a job in the domestic furniture industry being created because a government agent destroys a chair that's already in your home? In either case, a job is created in the furniture industry, and you must spend more money to buy a new chair. Aha, shouts the protectionist with a gotcha grin. Unlike the destruction of household goods, trade barriers force you to buy more domestically made goods. If all the US government did was to destroy existing goods, Americans would replace many of these with imported goods and thus not support American jobs. Trade barriers ensure that domestic jobs are created. Wrong. Protectionists fail to see a fundamental feature of all trade. Namely, sellers sell only because they want something in return. Foreigners sell to Americans only because they wish to buy from Americans or to invest in America. And foreigners are the same as you. If you ask yourself why you work, the answer ultimately is to earn income in order to buy goods and services, or to the extent that you save, to buy goods and services tomorrow. What do foreigners who supply Americans with imports do with the dollars that they earn? The same as you. Spend or invest them in the United States and dollars spent and invested in the United States support jobs in the American economy no less than if they are spent and invested by Mr. Chen Li from China or Mr. Chuck Li from Virginia. When Mr. Li from China sells furniture to Americans, he earns dollars. He spends some of these dollars buying American exports. He buys, say, American-made pharmaceuticals. The dollars he does not spend, he invests in America. He, say, opens a restaurant here in Manhattan. In both cases, jobs are supported in America. And so by preventing the Chinese Mr. Lee from selling furniture to Americans, not only does our government directly make us Americans as consumers poorer by obliging us to pay higher prices for furniture, our government also destroys jobs in industries that produce US exports and in industries supported by foreign investment. You see, it isn't true that imports destroy jobs. 
I challenge you to look at the data. You'll find that as imports into the U.S. have risen over the years, both absolutely and as a percentage of GDP, there has been absolutely no effect on the number of jobs, none. International trade neither destroys nor creates jobs on net. Instead, trade shifts jobs from sectors where workers produce less efficiently to sectors where they produce more efficiently. A trade barrier that protects a Jones job in the steel mill destroys Smith's job in the tire factory or the pharmaceutical lab. No one denies that trade destroys particular existing jobs, but trade also creates other particular jobs. Those jobs are destroyed by protectionism. And so if someone insists on focusing only on the particular jobs destroyed by trade in order to assert that trade destroys jobs, I can assert with equal validity that protectionism destroys particular jobs. And say protectionism destroys jobs. A larger point is that all economic change destroys some particular jobs and creates others. International trade isn't unique in this front. If you choose to eat more meals at home, you destroy jobs in local restaurants. If you go to the, on the Atkins diet, you destroy jobs in breweries and bakeries, and you create jobs in, on cattle ranches and on pig farms. If you quit smoking and become more health conscious, you destroy jobs in the tobacco industry and create jobs at gyms. International trade is just one of the many different avenues on which travel the forces of healthy economic competition and of positive economic change. And in the large countries such as the United States, trade remains a relatively minor source of job destruction and creation. The upper estimate, get this, the upper estimate of the number of jobs in America that have been destroyed by US trade with China since that country entered the WTO in 2001 is 4 million. That's the top estimate. Do you know how many jobs are destroyed on average each month in the United States? And I'm not talking about quits. I'm talking about jobs destroyed because the consumer demand for those jobs have fallen. The answer is 17, excuse me, 1.7 million. Each month, on average, 1.7 million jobs in the U.S. are destroyed because consumer demand for the outputs of those jobs have fallen. But also other jobs are created, which is why each month we see generally, except in recessions, a net increase in jobs. 1.7 million on average destroyed and roughly 1.8, 1.9 million jobs created. So my point here is that in any average 71-day period in the U.S., a period of just seven weeks, there is a destroyed by your economic change. It has nothing to do with, not much to do with economic, uh, excuse me, with, with international trade. It, it, as many jobs are destroyed in that seven-week period as it just have, has been destroyed by the, the, the allegedly horrible trade we've introduced, with, we've had with China over the past 16 years. But what about allegedly unfair trade practices by foreign governments? Shouldn't we retaliate when Beijing, say, subsidizes producers who compete with American producers? No. I agree that such trade practices are unfair, but they're not unfair to Americans. They're unfair to people subsidizing, the, uh, uh, excuse me, they're unfair to the people of the subsidizing countries. A foreign government subsidy might well enable foreign firms to sell more to American consumers, but two important facts go unnoticed by those who call for U.S. government retaliation. First, the subsidy isn't free. That subsidy draws resources away from other sectors of that foreign economy into the subsidized sector. So unless you believe that government agents are somehow miraculous at directing the economy, foreign government subsidies make that economy less effective. It draws resources away from where the market would direct them and put them in, and puts those resources into less efficient uses. The second thing that's missed by those who call for retaliation is that those subsidies make us Americans, to the extent that we buy the subsidized exports from those countries, it makes us richer. We get these goods at artificially low prices. We're no more harmed by getting gifts from foreigners than you're harmed if you get a gift from your neighbor. Look at the data and look at history. The freer is trade, the higher is both the country's per capita income and its rate of economic growth. We can hypothesize, you can spin stories about what if this, what if that, but history knows of no country that has been held hostage to a country that practices managed trade. In all cases, from Hong Kong, a perfectly free trading nation, and Britain in the late 19th century, a perfectly free trading nation, to not quite perfectly free trading, but still largely free trading nations, such as the US becoming more free trade over the uh, 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 post-World War II period. As nations become freer in trading, they become wealthier, the average standard of living rises. Protectionism is government intervention. 
And it's government intervention always against fellow citizens. It artificially raises the price American consumers pay for household goods. It artificially raises the prices that American producers pay for raw materials and inputs. It artificially reduces capital accumulation and entrepreneurship in America. And it artificially fuels special interest politicking and rent seeking, which is what always happens when you have government involved in directing economic matters. It trusts politicians and bureaucrats with all the power to superintend the economic affairs of all Americans. Protectionism makes us less free, and it makes us less prosperous.